And if I had known yesterday that it would be 16 hours of continuous travel to be with you, I would say I would do it again because I'd go anywhere for artistic excellence and I'd go anywhere for taboo. And you can cheer for that. <laughs> Thank you. But the upside was the long delayed flight in the airport eating M&Ms gave me some time to think about what I wanted to ask you, Taboo. Okay. And I decided that it might be a good opportunity to get a little below the surface tonight. You know, ask you some of those philosophical questions that are different than the superficial bullshit we're so accustomed to in the world these, this, these days. And so to begin, I wanted to ask you, if you could only ever watch one Elizabeth Taylor film again for the rest of your life, what would it be and why? Oh, there's so many. That's I guess I would have to go with, uh, I actually have it on my, on my desktop computer, Who's Afraid of Virginia Wolf? I love that one. But I was just quoting and explaining uh, Butterfield 8 to somebody just yet, just yesterday. Did you give us a little bit? A Butterfield A? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't know if you don't want that, but she actually won an Oscar for it. She hated that movie. She didn't want to even be in it. But uh, she needed to work because her husband, the love of her life, now, she's had many loves of her life and many husbands, but Mike Todd was the love of her life. He was the big Hollywood producer, and he loved her, and she loved him, and he died in a plane crash, and she was devastated. She never got over it. And... Uh, she was devastated. She really couldn't even uh, publicly, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, grieve. And uh, I forget who directed the movie. Nicholas Ray? I'm not sure. But uh, they said, let's do the script. And the script was like, mm, whatever. Oh, am I thinking of the right movie? <laughs> oh, Butterfield 8. We're talking about Butterfield 8. Yeah. Oh. Oh, no. I'm thinking about uh, Suddenly Last Summer. I think that was the movie where they, another take, another take. It's like, she's like, uh, you know, her husband is gay and goes to Morocco and buys rent boys and they come back and eat him alive, That's you know, metaphorically. Awesome. And she's like, really giving it all. And Catherine Hepburn, supposed to be the greatest actress of all, I can't stand her, but she's called that. But anyway, Elizabeth Taylor blows her off the table. But in this scene, Elizabeth Taylor, Elizabeth Taylor was actually under the table. Going crazy. So in the movie, Elizabeth Taylor, the mother of Montgomery Cliff, the closeted gay guy who gets eaten alive, she then puts Elizabeth Taylor into a mental hospital, and uh, so she's and they kept saying another take, another take, and it just gets it's really. But she wasn't. She might have been nominated, but she didn't win for that one. But, but the Butterfield Eight is incredible. She's a high class Park Avenue hooker, and she's at this married man's house. And it's the morning, and he's still drunk and asleep. And she just gets up and goes into the mirror. And she's in a, just a slip, and she puts on her lipstick. And she looks in the closet where the wife has all the furs, the ermines, and she just grabs the most expensive, if she has to live, they're calling me now, uh, it's the most expensive coat and puts it on, and then looks into the mirror and takes her lipstick and writes, no sale, and walks out. That's a really great, hey, how are you? And uh, so that's good. But uh, yeah. Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf is incredible. Edward Albee. I, <laughs> wait, wait, so which is the one you're, which is the one you're going to watch? Edward Albee. I've already watched well, it a million times. Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? For, for the rest of your life. Virginia Woolf, and I watched that again. I knew Edward Albee's assistant. Assistant, he was gay, but he wrote it about him and his gay lover on Fire Island or something, and he transposed it to them. And they were drunk and evil to each other, which was Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor. I think it was the first time they were married. They divorced, got married again, because they loved to beat each other up physically, emotionally, and sexually. But in that movie, they really rip at each other. I love all those things. I can, want to do, do some lines? All night. Yeah. Do some lines? Well, no. Don't, don't we're going to talk about me, not about Elizabeth Taylor. But why What's not? the difference? Oh, a lot. Um, well, I'm hoping we can get into those okay. differences. Okay, let me say the quick little lines. She goes, you good enough. She goes, oh, are you drunk? You, can I fix your drink, Martha? Rubbing alcohol, never mix, never worry. And she goes, oh, she goes, you can't afford vodka. Not good vodka, not on your salary. Not on an associate professor's salary. <laughs> you working in the history department. It's the biology department, the bog of the history department. Hey, Swampy! Anyway, that's one of I think that's also a clapping moment. Oh, okay. I'm glad that you gave us a... I'm glad that you gave us a detour through Suddenly Last Summer and Butterfield 8 to get there because when I was um, 
waiting with a mob of unwashed human beings at the airport, not getting any information about when the plane will be coming. I was thinking of that line from suddenly last summer where Elizabeth Taylor's describing um, her cousin being eaten by the children. And then she's telling the story and someone says, why didn't you call the manager? And she said, what manager, God? <laughs> That's how it felt. Anyway, I wanted to start on this little journey of like Hollywood Babylon because I feel like this show in particular is very Hollywood uh, site specific in a way. It seems to me like it's partly you dealing with your imagination about what Hollywood is and glamour and like the sunsets in California. And so I guess maybe to start like yeah, what does Hollywood mean to you? It's funny you would say Hollywood Babylon because Kenneth Anger just died and I met him. He did a speech at the, uh, he gave a reading or uh, interview. I talked about his art in the, at the Pyramid Club in 1983. And I went backstage and I brought Hollywood Babylon the book. Will you sign this? He goes, no, <laughs> get away from me. <laughs> and I said, wow, he really is anger, you know? And uh, his boyfriend was like, he won't sign the book, but here, just take a piece of paper, he'll sign the piece of paper, and you can tape it into the book. So I still have the book, and I still have the autograph, so I posted that on my Instagram post. When he died, yeah, I love, he's good. But we weren't talking about Kenneth Anger, we were talking about... Hollywood. Oh, Hollywood in general, yeah. yeah. My thing of Hollywood, yeah, it was... I've always loved Hollywood as a, uh, as a kid. That was where all the TVs and the movies came from. Oh, just work this side, too. <laughs> <laughs> What, is, what did Beyonce say? Uh, money bitches to the left, bad bitches to the right. If you want both in the middle, that's all right. Okay, so we're talking to talk about... Uh, How do you think it relates really to these paintings when you... Oh, Hollywood. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. How does it relate to these paintings? Well, I, like you said, when I was young, uh, being queer, in the 50s, in the 60s, in the 70s, and in today, it was still illegal, not just taboo. It was illegal. You could be arrested, even if you talked to another queen on the street, for like uh, uh, procreating sexual activity. They arrested for that. Girl, oh, we're just talking about the Elizabeth Taylor movie. When I even want to have sex. She's my sister, not my boyfriend. And they're like, are you under arrest? This is prostitution. They could arrest you. But I knew this queen. She used to run the biggest. Uh, transvestite boutique where truck drivers come in, get a size 15 pump, and uh, she lobbied the state, or the, yeah, the state, I suppose, and maybe even the, uh, the country, and made it illegal for them, for, it made it legal for homosexual people to kiss, to hug, to talk, and to be in public together. Yeah, Lee, Lee, and his shop was called Lee's Mardi Gras, yeah. But that was good. So, growing up like that, you know, I remember once my mother met my old uh, football coach in my high school, and they said, she said, he said, oh, I remember your son, he was great. He was the best guy on the team. She goes, oh yeah, Gary, he's really good, he liked that. Because my younger brother, Gary, was actually the, the captain of the football team and the quarterback. He said, no, Steven, boy, could that boy run. Because I was always being fag bashed after school. So I would whoosh, get out there so fucking fast. <laughs> So my escape was television and the movies. And when I was growing up, television was like the bastard child of movies. But so they would get, and they didn't even have enough shows to run, watch a lot of reruns. So they would, Hollywood would sell all their old movies to uh, television. So I watched all the old movies, the old movies from like decades before. It's fun the kids now don't even care about anything that happened last year. So I, when I was growing up, I wanted to know all about the things like in the 30s and the 20s and the 40s and all that kind of stuff. That was my cultural, like, wow, look at it all. Only to find out that most of it was an illusion. None of it was filmed where it was. It was all on a Hollywood backlog. But it was Technicolor. Oh, that's what I like. Elizabeth Taylor has a great quote. She goes, what do you, do you like reality or the movies? She goes, well, reality is, uh, it's life is, uh, is with, with bad lighting and, uh, and no soundtrack. I have to say something like that. Bummer. Yeah, but uh, she looked good anyway. I only saw her on television. I never, I never met her in real life. Once I worked for a photographer, and I had to bring these photographs up, uh, these contact sheets up to Elizabeth Taylor, and I went up to the lobby, and I was like, oh my god, oh my god. And the woman at the desk says, I'll just take those. I'm like, 
fuck. I wanted to go to Elizabeth Taylor. <laughs> I went back to the guy, said, did you meet her? How was that like? And I said, they took the fucking contact. She said, I never got to meet her. I was so, I knew if I met her though, I was gonna just fall on the floor and bust into tears. And he says, yeah, everyone that meets her does that. Yeah, that's why we don't let people meet her. Yeah. She's tired of it. Um, there's some... Oh, I'm, I'm hitting the... Oh, am I, am I, am I parched? Am I something? Cotton mouth? A little bit. No. Oh, I love this moment. It's so real. We have a technical moment. Fix this. It's like being in the audience for Hollywood Squares. <laughs> Is that a koala bear? Do you have a baby strapped to your bed? Is that a real baby? Are you a gay daddy? <laughs> wow. So one thing that's interesting about these group oh. of paintings, which I'm taking in for the first time, is that they have, is that they, first of all, I'm a little offended that we're not sitting in front of one, like it's a backdrop. Well, this is a widescreen thing, you're catching it all, right? There's two cameras. <laughs> no, but doesn't it see, I, I, what I like about it is it feels like it's supposed to be the backdrop. Well, it could be, scene. it could be. See, when I first started painting, I was a professional puppeteer and I did puppets because I wanted to produce and act and write and direct and do the set design and the costume design and the scene design and editing and all that stuff as a kid, but it was it's just me. So what do you do? You do become a puppeteer and you do it all. Right. So when it came time to do shows, they said, we need you to do drag. And it's like, okay, I already played the princess in my version of something. Or I was Little Red Riding Hood in my version. And so I would paint the backdrops. So in fact, when I do my paintings, almost all of them, except maybe a portrait, they are sort of scene, background scenes in a way, for like, and someone would say, imagine you're doing the scene for like the ballet, the New York City Ballet or an opera, like, woo. <laughs> and like, for instance, this one right here, this is my version of uh, the Wizard of Oz scene when they see Oz and they run through the, the poppy fields. Yes. That's my version of it. it but you know, so I don't like to give away my secrets. Like as a puppeteer, you don't want to go backstage. Look, it's a man, don't look at like a wizard, don't look at the man behind the curtain. But so I'm giving you, I'm telling you that because you're so sweet enough to come out on a night like this. So instead of poppies, I put Black Eyed Susans. But see, it's that sort of thing. Like the illusion is it's a, it's a deep depth of field, but in reality, it's a flat backdrop. And I knew that as a young kid. And when they sold The Wizard of Oz to television, because they needed, when TV, I'm so old, before the internet, before Bought and Water, before color television, it was just black and white TV. And they sold The Wizard of Oz to television. And when that would come on, only once a year, and it was in fucking television, wow, your mind would be blown. And they, because it's television, they would put commercials in it. Eee. Now when you watch movies on, on the cable, they put fucking commercials in it. Or you're watching anything on the internet or on TikTok, there's commercials. But, so I knew the commercials, and the big funny thing to me was when she's finally jumping out of, uh, she's, she's doing a, uh, it's called the Dorothy two-step, with the munchkins behind her saying, follow the yellow book club. And then she goes up, and the camera switches this way, and it shows her walking out up the yellow book road into the mountains to the thing. But I already knew as a, scenic backdrop that it was a flat thing. And right when she's about to hit right on the wall because she's drunk and she's so high on dexedrine, they cut to a commercial. And I always knew that. It's so funny. Yeah, anyway. Prodigy. But you were also a child musician, right? Or a musician. Yes. Magician. Musician? I know, I worked with magicians on the party circuit, the, the, you know, the Oktoberfest When you circuit. were doing puppets. Yeah, there would always be a puppeteer. And when I was out, you know, uh, whatever, then the magician would come in, or then the, well, there always been that, you know, the pony rides, whatever it might be, yeah. What I really love about the scale of these big pieces, and, and just like imagining them on the wall, is like, yeah, they make me think of, of film, but I like the idea of the puppet backdrop. But it also reminds me of like, um, you know, in, in the bitter tears of Petra von Kant, when she's like in the apartment and there's that big Poussin painting behind her and there's like a shag rug and they're crying on the floor. It just like feels like, like domestic drama is supposed to unfold in front of them. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna lose my gay card. I know it's Werner von Fassbinder, but I've never seen it, right? Wow. Did you get the director right? Going, yeah, of course. I know, the, I, know the, I know the drug dealer that purposely gave him the wrong drugs and he OD'd. <gasps> what? No names. <laughs> I've never seen the film, but... I've seen some of his film. The one, it would be totally canceled now. It's about a sex change. Well, and he edits, it's a cow 
coming from the pasture to the supermarket. And they show him being decapitated, skinned inside out, cut up down, slit the throat, blooded, the whole thing, into the thing, the woman picks it up and she starts eating. And they intersplice that with this trans girl going into the surgery having this time. You know, what was that movie called? A Year of Thirteen Moons. Who just yelled that out? Someone watched that? I heard it from. Oh, back here. Oh, of yeah. course you would know. Lissa knows everything. She's one of my filmmakers herself. Um, but but what you, was the question about that? I kind of wanted to ask the way that you think about them in, as backdrops in relationship to They're not backdrops, they're painting. I know that's they're paintings, from, yes. but when you were doing don't the back... Don't skipping with me, Miss. When you were doing the sets for okay, the Pyramid Club, as the press release said... Oh, yes, yes, I do. That. <laughs> I did. How, do how do you relate to these as, as providing, like, environment or providing, like, stage setting in the way that when you would do these performances? Well, I think just the idea of flat paintings came from probably the Middle Ages when they lived in these dark cement buildings and they needed to look out the window, but they couldn't look out the window because the people would throw a cannonball through them. So they were always like a, there would always be like a window. So if you're looking through it as if you're looking into another world. Now that's where they, when uh, cubism slapped it in the face and said, no, it's a two dimensional thing and that's paint. But before that, you were going into a world, it's a window into another world. So I'm bringing it back. But at the same time, it's flat, but at the same time, you know, I, I'm all things at once. I think you, you should have like a Sister Wendy style art history show. Remember her? Does anyone remember Sister Wendy? The nun, the lesbian nun? She, oh, she was incredible. And she had a lisp! Oh my God, remember her? Is she, I think yeah, she's, I brought her up. Yeah, I know, I know, but I don't think, I don't think, she, I don't think she's on like YouTube. I think she's yeah. lost to time, yeah. visually, you know? Yeah, but you know, when, I just would like to listen to you talk about the history of painting all Day. Okay, name a name a name a, a genre. Oh, you be Manet, I'll be Monet. <laughs> no, I'll my be daughter, Monet, you sister, be Manet. My daughter, my you sister. be Monet, I'll be Manet. Okay. Some of my paintings, I saw the, what was called the very first impressionist painting. That's what they call it. It's by Monet. Yeah, yes. Monet. <laughs> Manet did the most sexy pictures of the dead troubadour, the, the dead uh, conquistador, not conquistador, the matador, the dead matador. You ever seen that one at the Met? Yeah. Oh my God, was he gay? I don't know. You know, the artists, the cultural, they were all... They were all a little... Everyone's a little, yeah, it goes this way, yeah. But, uh, and it was a Monet, it was just a mystical, it was kind of like that, but really peachy and mystical, with just a dot of a red dot of a sunset. That's all it was. I was like, wow, it was so modern, yet so abstract, yet so, it was a sunset. So it was all at once, and yet beautiful, yet loosely painted, yet you could see it, you know it, and they're like, wow. What is this? At the time, they were shocked and they hated it. But I think that painting isn't even for sale if you had a billion dollars. I don't, I'm not sure where it is. The Louvre. He was French. It might be in the Louvre. It might be in the Met. It's in a museum somewhere. Can I talk to you? I got to slow down. No, so. no, you're good. It's okay. just, I'm just laughing so hard. Um, Laughing's good. So you, you, you see your um, sunsets sort of in that tradition of Impressionism. And Monet and all that. Mm, yeah, sunsets are, sunsets are when Mother Nature goes boom. <laughs> you know, it's incredible. It's when Mother Nature puts on drag? Well, yeah. Well, really goes full bloom, uh, depending on different places. Yeah, yeah. And when it goes orange, like the wild thing, I don't know, not, you guys are all, well, some of you are from New York. About a month ago, the toxic fires of Canada came down in the middle of the day. The whole city went bright orange, then dark red. It was like, it's the end of the world! Armageddon! And then it went away. It was like a sunset. It comes, it happens. In fact, this one, I only learned. And this one I did get from a photograph. Originally, I was getting it from a photograph because someone said, oh, you caught the green! I said, what are you talking about? And they said, in a sunset, for a second, there's a green flash. And if you see it, make a wish real quick. It only happens for a second. But if you do a painting, you buy that thing and hang it on your wall, you could wake up to that fucking green sunset every day in the room. <laughs> Any takers? <laughs> <laughs> and you could make a wish all day. That's what's cool about painting. Um, I'm wondering, <laughs> that's it. So I like classics. Yeah. I like Hollywood classics. Yeah. I like classic paintings. I like classic, classic things, like a classic tuxedo. 
I like a cla- like these are like a classic. Of the, well, don't go over the talk about the paintings. Uh, like what's so classic about Los Angeles? How about the Hollywood sign back there? That's classic. You know what I mean? Even at my hotel, they have it made out of moss. But I do it really pretty right at the Hollywood sign. And when I came to New York the very first time, I found there was some posters standing that says Hollywood, one of those skinny long world. And I have it in my kitchen, the Hollywood sign. It's such a classic thing. I haven't been up there. Have you been up there? No. Some of the movies they go up there. And it was originally Hollywood land, because it was a real estate market. This, this is a dump. But they said, let's make it, let's sell it as Hollywood land. It was just a dump because the f- Jewish filmmakers from New Jersey, it's just too cold to film these fucking uh, 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 desert scenes. Let's actually go to the desert, buy up all the property. I think Bob Hope and his family own most of Los Angeles, I think. I, and I do think of all the artistic uh, geniuses around Warhol, Hollywood Lawn was really, Wasn't she me, great? my spiritual guide. Yes, I met her many times. Really? What was that like? She was crazy. She had a weird, I think she had a lisp. She had a weird voice. She was great. She was funny. She was great. Last time I saw her, she was this, uh, oh, I won't get into that. I have a negative thing. But no negativity. She's great. But aren't we doing this sp- behind the scenes? Well, I do like my favorite quote of her in this movie uh, called, it was, again, that would be maybe canceled. In fact, when they asked me, I did this uh, thing, and they said, pick some films that I picked. A very rare, back before, nowadays you can get anything, really. But back in, when I was growing up, I couldn't see it. You couldn't see it. I hadn't heard about it. A movie called Pigs. It was called Politically Incorrect Girls Society? I forget the word. Like, but then they changed it to uh, Women in Revolt. Right. And it was Hollywood Lawn, Jackie Curtis, uh, 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 Hollywood Lawn, Candy Darling. Yeah. And they were, it was right in the height of uh, female, uh, women power, women's rights, what was that thing in the fem- feminine, femininity? You know, the whole Gloria Steinem, women's rights, uh, that whole thing in the 70s. So they made, made a movie about that. Nowadays, you couldn't do that because there's a whole thing called TERF. It's called Trans Exclusionary Radical Feminists. They're not women. They can't represent the women's movement. They're not even women. That's what the, today they would say that. But they made this movie. And at one point, Hollywood Lawn is bringing this trick home. And she's really only, he thinks they're going to have sex, but she's just bringing him home because he's strong enough to carry this potted plant she stole from the, 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 the bodega. He brings it into the apartment and then she says, now get out. Because the other girls, the other, the, uh, Holly and Jackie, they don't want a man in their life. They don't want a man in their apartment. And her big thing is, get out! Get the fuck out! So I love saying that all the time. <laughs> so before I started by asking you the philosophical question about Elizabeth Taylor, my other thought was to ask you, um, who is your favorite puppet? Well, immediately the first thing that came to my mind is Lamb Chop, because that's when I grew up. Again, it's great lashes. Great lashes. Uh, she was Jewish. Her real name was something, but she went by J- Sherry Lewis. Sherry Lewis. So she could get the kids in middle America to watch her. And it was a little hand puppet. And I still have it. It's the oldest thing I have. And I'm a tchotchke. Hoarder. I'm an archivist. Of, you have paintings of Lamb Chop, don't you? I've even painted her. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Because I paint uh, the thing, I paint things, sculptures too. Because it's hard to always get people to sit for portraits. And when you do paint that portrait, like, I don't look like that. Why'd you make me look like that? So it's okay. Never mind. I won't paint you. So I'll just paint uh, sculptures and plants and things that don't talk back. You know. But I have original. It's plastic. And plastic. Remember that? That was a famous quote. Plastic. I see the future. One word. Plastic. And now, remember right before COVID, they were saying, we're going to outlaw plastic straws. Then COVID came and said, fuck the plastic straws. <laughs> because when you get the paper straws, they all fold and you can't drink them anyway. But this puppet, Lamb Chop, is plastic and it's old, Western, but it's still there and I still have it. But is it my favorite? No, I don't know who my favorite is. My favorite, I would have to say, is Madam. Oh, my oh God. well, Madam. Icon. Yes, yes, and he's my good friend, Jerry. Jerry likes my corn. You know that from the Broadway musical Great Garden. Yes, Jerry likes my corn. Jerry is a friend of mine. Yes, and, and he before, worked for Wayland Flowers, right? That's when he worked for Way- when they fought, when he when they died. He said, "What am I going to do for a job?" So if he could work with those nut jobs, he worked with Wayland Flowers, who was such a gay queen out of the closet screaming. He couldn't be on TV, so he switched it and he made Madam be him. And when Wayland Flowers died, they buried Madam with it. But there's some queen who did a fake Madam and goes around saying, I have the real Madam. But Jerry told me, that's not the real Madam. 
I buried it with her. Well, apparently there were two madams. Well, they, well, you know, when Neil and Blake put one in an artwork and said it was real. Yeah, well, the one that they really, well, with anything, with showbiz, you always need a second costume. Like when Beyonce's on tour, I'm sure there's two of those ones with the hands. You get all sweaty and then we just get another, the second show, I'm not going to wear that. So there's two of everything, just in case. Taboo, what's the trajectory of your life as a painter in the sense that the early paintings that I know are so um, beautiful, but they often have figures in them. Like, People, there are still lives, letters, but this feels, both with the, the show that you had of cityscapes mm -hmm. at, at Karma in New York, and with this, this feels like a kind of different thing. When did you start painting landscapes like this? And do you paint them from oh. life? Do you go out and look at them? You do them Depending, from depending. I look out the window, I look at the sky, I memorize them, I see things, I take pictures of this stuff. And when I'm painting, my abstracts, I paint flat with water and acrylic and I go, ooh. So it could be the ocean, it could be a cloud, it could be a flower, you know. It just sort of comes to me. And when did I start? Mm, I don't know. I think the older I've got, I've really been uh, comfortable in my skin, cozy with who I am. I love myself goddamn cozy. <laughs> it's natural. No, cozy. It's natural from a couple of years ago. I think we're going to call this book Taboo's Nature or something like that. Taboo's Nature. But I, I, yeah, it's natural. That was, if you don't know, that was my hit single on MGM. Hit single. It yeah, was. It was. I know. That's why I brought it up. Okay. It's not um, natural. Do you want to give them a little taste? I just did. Oh. Oh, the rap, should I wrap it a little? Yeah. Give when it was a boy, I had a little toy. It wasn't really much at all. It was a doll. And the doll at that point was Mighty Mouse. Because Mighty Mouse was my childhood hero. He was this little muscular mouse, this beefcake and like skin tight outfit, and he would sing opera. He was an opera queen with muscle opera queen. Here I come to save the day. And in fact, what's his name? That's how he started his career, Andy Kaufman. He put the record on and lip synced to that. I don't know if you know that. You could Google that shit. But Mighty Mouse, and it has a little dog doll because you could, you would come, you'd buy the thing, and it was fabric, and you'd cut it out. And then you stuff it, and you sew it together. It was like a little stuffed, cheap, but Mighty Mouse doll. Mm. So when I was a boy, I had a little toy. It wasn't really much at all with a doll. You see, I was gay. My daddy said, why do you got to be that way? He took that motherfucking thing and threw it out. And then later he said, well, you can play with G.I. Joes. Those are action figures. So of course I got the one with the Marine who had the really good boots and the nice collar. And the, <laughs> the Marine outfit, my, my cousin. He had all the outfits, and I inherited those. So you don't see any difference between these paintings of the, of the landscape and what you would well, do? Well, I'm just saying paintings. what period you're going about when you talk about... Uh, well, I mean... Because I've done so many... When I did Pyramid's background, there would be psychedelic cartoony figures with all yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah, well, I was 20. I was on drugs. I was at a nightclub. It was night. It was a crazy time. It was a whole other world. Everyone spoke a different language. All the technology was different. It's a whole different thing. This is a different time. This is a different time. This is a more uh, cultured gentleman, dressed to the nines, very calm and very serene and very meditative and very intelligent and very particular with the colors in this. It's all very chic. I would say the softer side of taboo. The softer side of taboo. Yeah. I suppose. Do you see, but do you feel any strong connection between the kind of um, artifice and dazzle of when you were doing those pyramid performances and then what you're doing as a painter? Does it feel well, like I think these experience? dazzle. These definitely dazzle. You've got lighting in them, got everything. Mm -hmm. Orange, green, what more could you want? No, Red, but what, what, do you orange, see the connection? Yeah. Or does it between matter? Between dazzling, you? what was the other word you said? Dazzling? <laughs> dazzling <laughs> and um, genius. Uh, no, between doing uh, drag and being a painter, do you see that, do you feel that Well, drag is definitely public. You yeah. do your art in public, in front of people. Yeah. Painting, for me, is no one else is in the, except my cat. No one's around, just me, alone. And, um, did so That's you, the difference. But you were, you were also painting in the 80s when you were doing drag, so they had yeah. different roles. But painting was alone when I painted. Mm -hmm. yeah. In fact, I remember once when uh, Keith Herring died, they would call me to fill in because they, they needed like a big mural Keith Herring-ish thing and they knew I did black and white Keith Herring-ish thing. So I came in and painted the whole thing 
And then I came in later for the big opening in drag. And they didn't realize it was me and they didn't want to pay me. We want to paint, we were going to pay you. You have to paint live. Like Keith Haring liked to paint live. Maybe because he was so comfortable with his masculine sexuality and I wasn't in the 80s. Interesting. Yeah. So I couldn't really do that in public. I didn't want to. He did that in public. He liked to do that in public. Like even when he did the, when Grace, he painted Grace Jones. The thing. Mm -hmm. they were, I was hired to do a video for MTV when I painted the, the guy with the same. They were always thinking, well, if he can do it, you can do it. He's dead. It was called Taboo to do it. But I would not. And I remember the, the people, they weren't going to pay me because they said, you didn't come here. You never showed up for the opening. I said, I was there. I talked to you all night. That was me in drag. I guess I believe it or not, I, I what do they call it, stealth, I passed. I was cunt girl. I was a lot younger. When you're younger, you can really, you're more androgynous. You know, Margaret Howard to, Howard says in her book that she was getting, she was passing all the time. And then you look at pictures of her and it looks like the mom from The Goonies. Oh, she was a nightmare. I knew her. Her book was called, I was a white slave in Harlem. What a nasty drunk. Oh my God. Oh. Oh, that, by the way, when my book comes out, it's, called, it's my memoir, it's called Speak Ill of the Dead. <laughs> and you, the only way to sell a book, as some people know, is you have to have bold names. So I'm going to throw out all the bold names and read them to shit. But I wouldn't even talk about them if I loved them. If you bore me, and I, that's the worst insult you can give, I won't even talk about you. But if you're exciting, there's always good and bad. And people want to hear the bad. And that's that famous Betty Davis quote, right? Talking about Joan Crawford where she says, they say you're never supposed to speak bad of the dead, only good. Joan is dead, good. Oh, you're right, I like that. <laughs> and she, I saw the Betty Davis uh, house right over here, and your, the quote I know from her is when all the young models would come, and all the actresses would come to town and they'd see Betty Davis, oh, Miss David, do you have any suggestion? Do you have anything you could tell me that could make my life easier to get into Hollywood? And she said, take Fountain. <laughs> is that the right thing? Because Fountain is a street that crosses by real quick to get by. They thought you were going to say, you know, blow this poke director or learn to speak clearly. And was it, is it Fountain or Fairfax? Yeah, and then I, when I just went by the house, I realized that she lived right on Fountain. So she knew it. She wasn't not making that up. That was a real life thing. I just want to acknowledge the meta commentary, the meta comedy of two New Yorkers trying to make Hollywood jokes to people who live here. It's really funny. They probably know where Betty Davis lived, right? Yeah. You even knew the joke. You even knew the line, right? Yeah. Classic. Yeah. So in my fantasy, this talk was going to be kind of like a combination of Hollywood Babylon and Hollywood Squares. And I think the Hollywood Squares part of it is questions from the audience. Although I do have some original vintage uh, Hollywood Squares questions for you to fill in the blanks if people don't have questions. Well, I'm sure they have case. questions, but I thought, why don't you start it off with some questions? Right. Well, first, would you describe oh, what wait, Hollywood wait, Squares wait, wait. is? Wait, 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 sound. Take this moment. Would, would you, Just a minute. did you used to watch Hollywood Squares? Would you describe it for the children? Yes. It was all Hollywood, they're all queer, right? And in fact, Paul one Lind. Of, yeah, well, Paul Lind always got the center square, and he would always be. And good. tonight, darling, you're the center square. Yeah. Well, we're sharing. Well, it's not. Well, this is the square. This oh, is, but right. She's there. He would always do the most. Uh, what do they call that when you do a dirty jump for you? Double entendres. Yeah, it's all about double, double entendres. Entendre. That's French. Yeah. Uh, uh, he would always do that. But then there was uh, Wally Cox, who was Marlon Brando's roommate lover, who had the biggest stick in Hollywood. Wally Cox was always on there. And then, you know, the Arquette family, David Arquette, uh, Roseanne Arquette, uh, Alexis Arquette, who was a friend of mine. She's dead. But they were the Arquettes, and it was... What's his name? Okay, he was Charlie Weaver. He was he played the role of the guy, fat hillbilly. Well, I don't know what that was. He was always in the corner, and they would get Brett Summers, the bull and she'd be up in the top, giving all these horrible, weird things. Brett Summers, who was married to Jack Klugman, married to Jack Klugman. Yep. And then who else was on there a lot? They get Cloris. They get like Florence, uh, the mother of the Brady. But they have Anderson. weird people. Yeah, they have. It was a B-list thing. Like I'm not getting booked. Come on my show. I think Mark Griffin owned that. Did he own that Yes, one? of course. Of course he did. He owned the Beverly Hills Hotel, by the way, too. But now it's owned by the Sultan of Brunei, who hates the gays and throws them off the roof. But what's once, you know, the clock squints, which is this way. Yeah, he does. You didn't hear about that? The, oh, real estate, baby. That's a great line. It's the only thing that lasts. The land, Tara. Scar Scarlet. 
Tara, the land. <sighs> the only thing that lasts, invest. If you don't spend the money, the government will take it from you. Taxes. Yeah. The other thing that lasts, the other thing, the inevitable things, death and taxes. We're all going to die. And if you don't pay your taxes, it's a long list of people who have to fucking run with friends. No swears. Go next. Next question. Give me, <laughs> well, we haven't even got the first question. So the idea is that there's a grid of celebrities and then this guy telling... It was tic-tac-toe. It was tic-tac-toe and there was goofy ass phrases with blanks in them. And then the celebrities would come up with like a, a humorous, non-scripted, allegedly, answer for, that would amuse the people. Um, was that a, You know what's funny? It what? just occurred to me, on the RuPaul's Drag Race, she does a thing called Snatch Game, and that's what it's a takeoff. It's not really a, a takeoff on Match Game, which it's is another show. Like it's more like Hollywood, Hollywood Squares. Squares. But Snatch is like a, a cunt joke. You can slide under the thing, you know. They had to stop saying she -male. We've got she -male. And the trans community went crazy. But they still do Snatch Game, because it's the most popular thing. Because they get to dress up as a famous celebrity. And the kids nowadays don't even know what celebrities are. They do the most stupid things. I mean, who are you supposed to be, Donna Summer or Diana Ross? And he goes, I've never heard of those. Who are they? I was like, oh my god, there's like drag queens? OK, go ahead now. Oh, well, the other thing I thought that was very kind of different, because Hollywood Squares questions are very like um, dopey. Yeah. But um, I, I also thought we could do like a kind of diva um, lightning round, okay. where it would be like this person versus this person. You'd say, I like that person because of this reason. OK, go ahead. In like, regard to my paintings? Yes. OK, go ahead, start. Monet, Manet. Uh, I'd go with Manet, believe it or not. You know, there's a show I just saw at the Dorsey, incredible. The Doris Day at the museum? The Doris Day Museum in Paris. And it's coming to uh, the Met in the fall. And it's Manet I love him. and Degas yeah. head to head. So now we're going to pivot. Well, you know, Degas was the first famous painter to use photography in his work. And when he would do like a ballet dancer going like this, and it would just be the foot, they say, it's a decapitated leg. Why did, what is that? That's horrible. He goes, no, that's a, uh, you crop it because you look like a camp. Like these were look, like back in the day, like all those things were looking through a window. But now the window is a camera lens. Like this camera lens. So you could crop things up. For instance, uh, like that one over there. See the palm tree? It's not a stick. That's the palm tree close up. But the, the camera lens has cut it off the top. So it gives a whole kind of different thing. It's a whole new way of looking at stuff that did not happen before the camera. And Degas was the first to use it. And there are photographs of it, or his original photographs. So that could be a whole show, too. I want, I want, it's not a stick, it's a palm tree on a bumper sticker. Yeah. Um, the camera cut it off. Um, where did you learn art history, Taboo? Just. I, uh, uh, the School of Hard Knocks. Yes, the only way to learn. So, okay, we did that. Oh, but now we're gonna do Manet Degas. Which one do I like better? Yeah, we gotta choose. Manet Degas. I don't really like Degas. I don't really like the ballet, believe it or not. Interesting. I don't, I'm a, I'm a I shoe. I won't tell them. You know, I'm a shoe fetishist, and those horrible ballet slippers, gross. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe um, if they did it barefoot. You know, I assumed that the swans were kind of um, a swan lakey thing. No, okay. A couple of years ago, I had a residency. Again, I'm new to the art world. I've been in the art world, but the real art world? I didn't know what a residency. They pay you and give you money and give you free food. What? I had to scratch and claw for what I got. So they put me there and said, I don't want to go. I hate Fire Island. Those are the wrong kind of gays. Yes, there are the wrong kind of gays. Like there are a lot of the wrong kind of everything. But there's a lot that never put anyone in a, in a thing. There's so many, it's an individual thing. So when we went to Fire Island, which is basically a sand barge off of Long Island uh, in, near the, in the Atlantic Ocean, uh, they need fresh water because you can't drink salt water, you die. Like if you're on a raft and the boat sinks and you're on a raft and you're dying of thirst in the middle of the ocean, don't drink the salt water, you will die within five minutes. Okay, so in Fire Island, they actually have fresh water and it's pumped in through a, through a uh, what would you call that, a pump. The land pump. And it was, I, the, the residency was way down the end. So the, the pump, the freshwater pump, was way down. And it would go right past the house. And, would, and the excess, because it fills up, and if you don't want to fill up, then it's going to, so the excess would go into the bay. And the fresh water would attract swans. 
You'd wake up, not to rats, not to mosquitoes, not to pigeons, swans. Gorgeous. But those motherfuckers are mean. Because when you're that gorgeous, everyone wants you. You know what I mean? Brad Pitt can't go out of the fucking house. They asked Michael Jackson, if you could have anything, what would you want? He has just one hour in the supermarket. He couldn't get that, you know? So the swans would come there, and I don't know if you know that they mate for life. There's always two, always two. And if there's one, it's so sad. <laughs> ah! yeah. And I was just there on Sunday, and I saw the mate, and they had a little, is it called a gosling? It's called a swanling? What's a baby swan called? What? A signet, like a signet ring. Spelled differently. Interesting. Spelled differently. Connection. And I love a swan. Yes, and my friends just had a baby, and you're never going to guess what they named it. Swan. Yes. Oh, I was it's hoping so that It's so non-binary, because right. you don't have the gender reveal until they decide what it is. You know, so I don't want to... swan is what it is. I don't want to break the fourth wall, but, you know, we ran into each other on Fire Island about five days ago. Yes. And you were really putting on a show in the harbor there. I'm always putting on a show. Can you believe it? That's why when I leave the house, you have to look good, because everyone's going to see you. Dolly Parton never leaves. The, even when she has guests, like Joan, Jane Fonda was a guest at her house. She said, you know, I woke up in the middle of the night, and I saw Dolly in the kitchen. She looked perfect. She didn't leave the bedroom without fully being done. In her own house. Not me, no. A true I'm naked. Artist. As soon as I walk in the door, everything comes off. <laughs> and you paint in your house. In my studio, in, yes. In your studio. My studio is in my house, right? Right, connected. right, right. Yes. Because when you get, when the feelings hit you, when you go. Well, maybe that's another way of, of kind of thinking about this is your, your studio and your home is like an artwork. It yes. is really... It's been photographed extensively. Extensively. Yes. <laughs> your apartment and Marlena Dietrich's apartment. But... I've never been to her apartment. Well, there were photos. There were? What I, about I, this, Penny? Sunset Boulevard. Oh, all right. That's so let's finish incredible. with Sunset Boulevard. Finish? Is it almost time? Well, well. We'll ask people. Well, you know what that's from? Bewitched. Well. <laughs> yeah, I know. When her daughter was Elizabeth Tabitha, Montgomery. which I'm kind of named Montgomery. after. Yeah. All right, so Sunset Boulevard. Let's, let's kind of end with Sunset Boulevard, and then we'll do questions. Okay, okay yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, my father worked for the electric company, and, <laughs> yeah, but he worked in the... The New England Electric Company, Ready Kilowatt. And so a lot of his friends worked in the wires and you climb up the pole and they would get killed in lightning storms. So so many of his friends, we went, he would go to the moors because they were hit by lightning when they're climbing up the pole. Because when there's a, light, a thunderstorm, the lights, the powers go out and they call the, my power is out. So they send out the guys, they climb up the poles, they get hit by lightning and die. So, uh, but he, so he wouldn't do the, 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 the power lines. He only worked down in the, in the, uh, Underground, because they started putting the, the, the wires and everything under, in the, like, not the manholes, but down underground, or he looked down there. So, when I came to Fire Island, and when I came to Hollywood, I realized, what? What is this, the 1940s? They still have, like, telephone poles and wires upon the, why? Because of uh, earthquakes. Yeah. And the sand, you can't really put it under there. So that was a specific, classic Los Angeles thing. And so I would do that. So again, that's the Degas photographic. What are those lines? The cut off. It's the, the thing. And again, I'm really good with composition too. The two lines here and the three lines there. Beautiful. And that's not actually Santa Boulevard, like, like we are in Santa Boulevard. That's actually you know, not Los Feliz, not Echo Park. The next one down, Silver Lake. That's in Silver Lake. Yeah. Wait. I'm so sorry. I have to backtrack for a second. What was Ronnie Spector's me memorial like? Why were you there? Because I'm a huge... I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of me in drag. She you, was my... You were trying to be Ronnie Spector. I, wasn't I was trying to be me, but she was my <laughs> fucking fashion icon. Why do you think faggots love Ronnie Spector so much? We don't use the word faggots. Actually, I, I do. And me too. You know, anyway, we can say whatever we want. I'm not a fan by anything, except, I, uh, I don't know, boredom. Yeah. Anyway, so go ahead. So, no, yeah. but I, wondered, so I went to Ronnie Spector. I wondered, yeah, like because, I worship be, Ronnie Spector, okay, but like because what's, why? One of my old producers from back when I worked the nightclubs, yeah. still does events and still does nightclubs, and so he he put on that event. It was just her family. Where was it? 
Well, because now she went Jewish. She married, she divorced uh, Phil Spector. Of course. He beat the shit out of her. And uh, she doesn't even talk about her children with him. She married this incredible sweet Jewish guy. And so he, they had a big Jewish memorial at the Chelsea Piers, that fancy one. And they had all, that's where Diane Wallach, they gave, a lot of people came in and did photos. Like, a lot of people actually did show up and sing and perform. It's really touching. It was so touching, oh my gosh. It was, yeah. But couldn't, she had actually died in COVID, and like many people who died in COVID, you couldn't do the funerals, you had to wait. But she died after Phil, which seemed like he, a little Phil small died bit. in COVID. Yeah, he did. He died because of COVID. In prison. Yeah, karma. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Okay. There's a scene in her memoir where she's like... Oh, that book is incredible. Be My Baby? Yeah. One of my favorite books. My painting of that is incredible, yeah. You, I did, well, that's my only charcoal. I used to work in an art supply store, so I'd sometimes dabble in some of the other art things, and I did a charcoal of the cover of that Winnie Spectre thing. And where is it? And now? my friend Jack, when he first, when he first hit it big, he hired, his name is Chuck, what's his name? Fuck. Chip Duckett. But nobody liked him, and he was an asshole in the 80s, and people called him Shit Bucket. Because when they went home with him, he was, into, he was what they call a browning queen, and it was but, uh, so, but anyway, he still, so when Jack made a big, Chip Duckett produced his thing, he says, who do you want to perform with your thing? And he goes, the Supremes or Ronnie Spector. He goes, I'll get them both. He can do that. Of course, Dinah Ross wouldn't do it. And Mary Wilson, so he got Mary Wilson. And Flo was dead. Yeah. And, and, and Sidney Birdsong, whatever happened to her, I don't know. So he got Mary Wilson and Ronnie Spector to sing at it, and I designed the poster. Yeah. So she, must have, so she saw it. She saw my artwork of hers, yeah. Well, what I love about that memoir is, first of all, the scene where she's going to run away from the house in Hollywood, and then Phil takes her into the basement. It's like, this is a glass coffin that's for you, and I'm going to watch you even when you're dead. Yeah, I knew all about the gun thing way before. I was a Beatles fan. I mean, he would hold the gun the to John, John Lennon's said, head, motherfucker, and we're going to do another take. Leonard Cohen. But the other thing about, about that book is that, like, remember when she moves to New York, and then she tries to go see that show that Divine and Hollywood Lawn are both in, and she's like, Beyond I'm Warren. bored. Yeah, she goes to see Neon Woman. She's too bored. She's wait she's like loitering in the lobby and she meets this gay guy who's like, I'm your biggest fan. And she's like, oh, let's be best friends. And like, maybe we'll have a baby together, but it doesn't work out. But ever since then I've been wondering, like, what is it about the Ronette's aesthetic, about the vitality? Hot. The hottest look. The tight dresses, the high heels, they all sit together. And when you're related, the harmony is the best. That's why the Bee Gees, the anyone, cousins if and the, the Beach Boys, if you're related, the DNA, the vocal, it's together. And they could do the fucking harmonies. Incredible. And the hairdos. That's why when someone said, have you seen the someone doing you? I said, what? Someone's doing Taboo. What? I found out it was uh, Amy Winehouse. <laughs> 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 and at that time, I didn't know, I still don't know what the kids listen to. Like, What's this Amy Winehouse? And then, oh my God, was she good. As good, maybe. She's a better singer than Ronnie Spector. I know that's heresy, but she's well, good. Ronnie had a very limited voice, but yeah. it was like the life. But the look, the hair, yeah. the teeth. I'm a hair she queen. That up or ah, the drag, the, 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 the wig queens. Talk about Phil Spector. When they went to court, and he first had the huge orange juice and they mocked him. So he came in with a little platinum pixie, a uh, pixie dig. Oh my God. And when he went to prison, they said, nope, no wigs for you. Snap, snap, snap. Oh my God. What about when Ronnie Spector said she never saw him without a wig when they were married? He would go into the bathroom and take it off at night when they were already, the lights were out. Anyways, okay. from my home to yours, thank you for coming. Thank you, Kevin. We have a warning at the beginning. If you're offended by anything like this, don't watch channel. it. Scroll by, scroll on by. Yeah. Scroll on, scroll on by. by.